Okay, uh, shall I start? Yes. Yes. Okay, so today we'll be discussing regarding the national environmental policies and how those policies are ingrained in our uh, environmental rules and guidelines and what is their role in, uh, role in environmental protection. Okay, so earlier before uh, this sex, uh, session, we had attended and uh, uh, we had discussed about the international environmental governance and what are, what are the policies, how it came into picture, how what was the historical perspective of international environment governance and how it framed different kind of international environment policies. So uh, our national environment policies are basically a reflection of international guidelines and policies which have been framed and which uh, in the India is already a signatory to those international guidelines and platforms. And that's why we have already started introducing new concepts in our national environmental policies. So in this presentation, we'll be discussing about the objectives of this presentation. What are you going to learn? What will be your learnings at the end of this uh, session then the need of environment policy why do we actually need to study about environment policies brief history of environmental policies national policy tools for sustainable development policy statements for uh, abatement of pollution environment action program national conservation strategy and ob objectives of national environment policy again principles of national environment policies regulatory reform standards technologies awareness education information what is their role in actually actual implementation of these policies at practical level on ground in field okay so basically due to uh, introduction of these policies by government of india we have to regularly adopt some measures for conservation upgradation and protection of environment so again, in, as India is original signatory to United Nations conference held in Stockholm in 1972, so it is our prior mandate as well as our responsibility to abide by all the commitments we have made do, as an original signatory to this conference. And in early 70s, the issue of protection of environment and sustainable use of natural resources came into picture due to different kind of pollution related problems we started observing in our environment. And with four, fourth five year plan in 1968 to 73, there was a special uh, specific recognition which was given to integration of environmental concepts into our complete overall planning and development process of our country. So that's why uh, a specific uh, uh, specialized ministry with, which was defined and it was given a task of oversee all those functions of integration of national environmental dimensions into planning process. So apart from the planning commission, apart from the five-year plan, uh, this responsible, there was a full-fledged environmental ministry which came into picture in 1985. So before that, there was no single body in our country which was uh, responsible for overall management of environment related issues. And thus, as this ministry came into picture, a need for comprehensive policy was identified so that all the sectors across the country, be it agricultural sector, be it MSME, be it large scale industry, be it aeronautical uh, industry, be it nuclear industry, be it mining industry. So all those different sectors should be integrated and different kind of approaches, uh, say uh, economic subsidy related approaches or monetary monetary uh, benefits that can, can could be accrued by industries and different sectors and uh, the kind of rules regulations as well as the fines and uh, fiscal opportunities which can be given to different sectors for control of environment pollution and for introducing better technologies so that all could be done if there is a comprehensive policy so that need was identified so after completing this unit, you will be able to understand what is the need of a national environment policy and how different areas are addressed in this policy. 
so there was need because we need to conserve environmental resources we need to ensure that the people who are directly dependent the people who are living in rural areas the deep people who are living in tribal areas or we are, who are directly dependent on forest resources for their livelihoods they should be able to get these resources without any degradation to that resource okay so what is the optimal level of utilization of these resources so that there is no extinction of uh, or biological species of medicinal plants or animals or flora fauna so all that need to be regularized that's why a need for environment policy came into picture so how this advent of national policies was done in 1988 national forest policy came up after that 1992 national conservation strategy and policy statement on environment and development so other if you see the names of these policies then you will be able to understand the objectives and the uh, need for those kind of policy statements which which came up in different eras starting from 1988 till now if you see uh, 2002 so uh, coming from national forest policy because uh, in the last lecture also we discussed that first national uh, forest act came in british era so at that time there were the objective was different because uh, british rulers they didn't want it that these uh, areas should be open to all the fighters or freedom fighters who can find a recluse in these areas and they can plan uh, and plan something against them so though for that objective they wanted that these forests should be secured under their command but after that uh come uh, this forest pol act was again revised to introduce certain measures so that the, these uh, there are some uh, restricted protected areas reserved areas and no land can be declared all of a sudden to non forest use as well so all those policies started coming up after 1988 and national conservation strategy was also a part of the overall uh platform which was created for environment and development then came the abatement of pollution policy in 1992 national environment policy 2006 which also gave a new uh, look to our uh, environment impact assessment notification which again came in september 2006 again national agricultural policy was framed in 2000 which is a very recent policy national population policy national water policy again came up in 2002 so uh, again the role of these policies is wherever they find a gap uh, in some kind of issue that needs to be resolved in environmental context in pollution context in sustainable development context that needs to be filled up so whenever we find any gap we need to fill it up through a, a proper policy policy is basically a, an outline of action plan our uh, principles or our philosophy on which our activities can be based which can be implemented in ground okay so it does not always uh, displaces the old policy so whenever some new policy or some amendment comes up it is basically to build upon the earlier policy to give it a strength and to fill up the gap which has been found during uh, say for example our legal uh, dealings of these uh, issues on daily basis for example if ngt finds that there has there is no policy to govern uh, mining projects at district level so then they introduce an environment impact assessment notification amendment to identify for example uh, areas less than 500 Uh, square kilometer they were given a district level identification so again if some uh, pil is launched that at district level so, so much of uh, ambiguity is occurring people are dividing their pieces of land on in small sizes so that they can get those clearances at district level then again we uh, we identify okay this gap needs to be filled up and people should not uh go for smaller pieces of land and do mining without getting any clearance so again that uh, gap is filled up with a new policy or new amendment with better strength of uh, dealing with these kind of uh, uh cases against uh, control of environment pollution okay 
so earlier policies included national forest policy national conservation strategy policy statement of on abatement of pollution and historically if we see it started with the ancient india period with 321 to 300 bc uh, with the writings of arthashastra written by kautilya and it contained specific provisions which meant to regulate a number of aspects in the environment and again emperor ashoka he also started writing uh, regulations related with environment on the fifth pillar he created in 265 to 38 bc so if starting from 1853 we note down all those kind of uh, acts and policies came into picture in british india era only so starting from 1853 when we had this sure nuisance act and then in 1912 we had bird birds and animal protection act so this regulatory provision of uh, environment uh, protection came into picture well earlier in india okay so but uh, actual implementation and ac actual bodies which needed to be created for institutionalization of these uh, implementation activities that came into picture quite later so that was the reason why in spite of having so many environment policies we were not able to get the uh, get any results on ground because the implementation part was lacking the body who, which uh, which was required to implement these rules regulation was lacking okay so in 1985 when uh, ministry of environment and forest was evolved and then ministry of environment and forest further identified central pollution control boards state pollution control board and which kind of people what kind of team can be recruited under these boards what will be their specific designations their eligibility criteria their experience of work those all kind of measures were again given in environment impact assessment notification so again uh, they together formed a regulatory and administrative core of our every sector okay so this 1992 policy it gave a strategy on environment and development which can be brought out by moef in 1992 and then environment action program was formulated in 1993 and that program is, is still continuing if you see uh, if you go to school level if you go to community level there are national environment awareness activities which are going under that program since 1993 okay so many uh, uh, ngos they are acting as Uh, nodal agencies for active impl actually implementing these programs at local level at regional level okay and i have been fortunate to work uh, with few of these ngos in the initial stages of my career so uh, again with first initiative was started in strategy formulation for environment protection in a comprehensive manner again it started national environment policy diagnosed what are the causes which cause land degradation which uh, which can be flagged so that remedial actions can be taken uh, accordingly in that direction so in nas national environment policy there was an explicit account whether there have been an intentional impact on land degradation degradation or an unintentional unconscious impact so all those uh, actions needed to be taken into account so that we can identify specific policies which can give you better benefits if you take care of the environment as well as your development or the industrial uh, development in your area so national environment policy it basically identified solutions which are science based which can be used on as uh, in, in a line with traditional land use based practices which can help us in uh, identifying pilot scale demonstrations which can help us in large scale dissemination of information like your uh, swachhta uh, swachh bharat abhiyan so it is again disseminating information at a very large scale right from the top to the bottom at the local level okay so then adoption of multi stakeholder partnership like ppp public private partnership was introduced government and ngo partnerships were introduced r and d and uh, scientific development partnership were introduced by dst and promotion of agroforestry was introduced watershed management product uh, projects were introduced by agencies like kapart okay so uh, or again organic farming environment uh, sustainable cropping patterns 
like krishi uh, vigyan kshetra uh, were introduced okay so all those uh, different sectors were incorporated and different policies were integrated so that the comprehensive uh, objective of achieving environment uh, protection of environment and sustainable development can be done so in modern india again we have already discussed all these policies came up right from the policy statement for pol abatement of pollution till an and national environment policy 2006 so what are the objectives now we come to uh, we have uh, discussed regarding the need of these policies what were the agendas which were to be addressed by these policies how these policies came into picture from the british era till now so now we'll study what are the objectives and aims so a objective is to integrate all environmental considerations into every kind of decision making process we do at every level local regional or national level so we whenever we de define any developmental activity any kind of industrial project or any kind of uh, project related with agroforestry or organic farming our key issue, uh, uh, issue or our key concern should be to ensure that it is environment conscious it is environment friendly and it is sustainable in a longer term okay so that is the objective again if you see aims what are the specific aims to prevent end of pipe treatment approach okay so we need to stop pollution at the source that is why we always talk about uh, an installation of effluent treatment plant in the industry itself to ensure that there is a waste segregation at the household level itself okay so that there is no large scale uh, problem created which cannot which is difficult to be resolved which needs lot of resources so if we prevent any pollution related problem at the source it reduces the amount of energy amount of uh, in uh, financial resources amount of technological uh, uh, advancement that is required for resolving that problem if we do not solve it at a so at the source itself for example if an industry does not employs uh, etp effluent treatment plant or stp at the industry level itself rather uh, rather than going for pollution at source control approach it goes to end of pipe treatment and discharges all of the water into a river stream so that way it is polluting a large volume of water in a river and again threatening uh, threatening and posing a health hazard to the population which is connected to that river stream so that problem goes to larger dimension if it is not treated at the source so that needs to be our first aim okay then again encouraging developing and applying the best available practical technical solutions for pollution control so that was our second aim so that nobody should uh, deter from uh, taking up some new technological advancement uh, help and introducing it into their uh, industry for abatement of pollution again there were mass based standards which were revised and then the specific limits were encouraged to minimize the waste to promote recycling to reuse materials and to conserve natural resources particularly water so before that um, water was not a prime issue which was considered in uh, conservation of natural resources again assistance for adoption of clean technologies was one of the aims and ensuring that for all the polluters who are creating pollution in the environment in the society they should be paying for that pollution created they should pay for the tangible and intangible damages caused to the environment and that was again an objective of abate uh, policy statement for abatement of pollution so if you see the name of this policy statement abatement of pollution and if you correlate all the aims and objectives with this name of policy then you will be able to understand and you don't need to mug up uh, all the aims and objectives you you will clearly be able to uh, uh, recall all these objectives and aims okay 
so again there was a name that regulatory measures that remain essential for the effectiveness of the policy and there should be clear signals for industries and consumers about the cost of using environment and natural resources they should not feel that any environment resources available free of cost so that's why specific charges were levied sex act was created water sex act was created and there was an annual at statement that was required to be submitted in the name of environment audit and in the uh, form of form 5 okay that form 5 needs to be filled up under the environment audit requirement so that there is an annual statement of what kind of specific pollution specific pollution means per for per unit of production how much uh my pollution is being caused how how much water is being used how much uh, hazardous waste is being generated how much sludge is being generated waste water is being generated for every unit of production for every meter of uh, cloth manufactured for every kilogram of steel manufactured for every unit of power generated for any kind of industry okay so that is a specific utilization of resources and that annual statement takes care of that in the form of environment audit and again we have to do resource accounting we have to involve people in our decision making process especially women and children or who are most of the times they are deprived of basic resources they should also be involved in decision making process and this commitment should go to the local level so that all kind of information which has been published in the environment domain that should reach to the communities okay so again if you see all these uh, aims they are correlated with each other and if we are able to implement the aims we have discussed we will definitely increase productivity we will uh, if, uh, increase utilization of forest produce in a more efficient manner we can you know, ensure that our land and soil is conserved and they we are getting enough resources for our uh, communities okay so again uh, they they were uh, uh, there was a act, aim of an establishing national wasteland board under this policy so that all the wastelands that have been created in the uh, naturally or man made they should be Uh, remediated they should be they should be harnessing of inputs from science and technology to ensure that these wastelands are developed in some manner and they should be utilized for a uh, better uh, environmental re resource development okay so again there has to be promote uh, promotion of sustainable use of land by classification and control of soil erosion zoning of land use so before that uh, if some industry needs to be established any kind of land could be used but after zoning of land use if we if you want to construct a building on an agricultural land you have to take a clu clearance of land use or or you have to get the land transferred from agricultural to industrial or construction uh, use of land okay so all those uh, things can come up now uh, special economic zones have been created under zoning even for groundwater also groundwater mapping has been done for different areas and over exploited zones and exploited zones and dark zones as well as safe zones they have been categorized so all these policies are not, not just for one sector so all these aims are also not for one sector they have to be implemented sectorally in all the different sectors okay again we have to prevent construction near water bodies so again for that if we don't have a policy statement we cannot uh, frame laws and acts Uh, without a policy so if we have a basic framework of policy okay this is our aim this is our objective now our activities now our acts and rules are are all should be aligned according to this policy statement that is the purpose of policy statement and defining all these aims under policy statement so again uh, uh, an action plan for sustainable management of agriculture was framed wherein we have uh, identified integrated pest management and nutrient supply system so for agriculture also uh, well, the phasing out of certain chemicals like ddt it could be done only because of this policy 
so with this policy laid down aims that we have to phase out and stop persistent and toxic pesticides so accordingly there were bans introduced for toxic and persistent pesticides who were which were causing long term uh, effects of like biomagnification or bioaccumulation and uh, they were causing uh, our water in our rivers uh, in our ponds at local level or in rural areas also all ponds were being converted into lands because of the issues related with eutrophication so that again is linked with persistent and toxic pesticides which are very much rich in nitrogenous and phosphates and they are having recalcitrant compounds which cannot be degraded easily through natural environmental cycles and processes so that was the reason why uh, these uh, persistent and toxic pesticides were phased out again there was a restriction on diversion of prime agricultural land as per the zoning of land use and animal husband husbandry policy was introduced improvement in genetic variability was introduced so then comes your environment action program in 1993 so priority areas there were four priority areas basically so the first was the control of industrial and related pollution then was tackling of urban environmental pollution problems okay then third was strengthening the scientific understanding of environmental issues because at that time in 1993 our scientific understanding of environmental issues was lacking due to lesser uh, r and d done in these areas due to lesser projects which were implemented for understanding of environmental issues and be, be, uh, lack of even uh, the courses on environmental programs like our educational and professional uh, courses were also lacking because there was no specific information or no specific guided uh, structure of curriculum which which could teach how environmental issues need to be tackled so professionalism was not there in uh, scientific understanding again there was emphasis uh, on prevention of pollution and conservation of natural resources so that we can compete with the international markets for example if in a pharma industry if you are not having a who compliance or gmo certification good manufacturing practices gmps are not introduced then you cannot trade with any you cannot export your pharma product to any international market so if you have to grow then also you need to prevent pollution and conserve natural resources and understand and envi international environmental uh, uh, acts and guidelines and all kind of voluntary standards like iso 14000 so what Uh, can be implemented what needs to be adopted to place yourself at an international level that was again emphasized under environment action program of 1993 so the uh, after discussing the priority areas we will discuss what are the objectives okay so first objective was conservation of critical environmental resources resources which are uh, restricted in amount resources which are Uh, unreplaceable resources which can uh, which cannot be recovered again in a uh, short period of time so those resources need to be identified and recover uh, reserved as well as conserved then intra generational activity uh, equity sorry so intra generational equity means you have to have equitable equal access to environmental resources and quality for all sections of society it should not be the case that people living in slum areas they can be deprived of uh, good air or what good water quality and people who are better well off and be living in urban areas they can be given better water quality and air quality so there has to be equitable distribution of environmental resources and if some uh, and uh, community is being deprived of those resources uh based on their intra generational uh, disparity that should not be the case so again intergenerational equity intergenerational we have to ensure that our present generation as well as future generations are getting equal benefits there is an equitable distribution between present and future generation it should not be the case that present generation completely uh, utilizes and exhausts uh, is exhausting all the resources and those resources are not available in future 
that should not be the case again integration of environmental concerns as we have already discussed that was again a part of national environment pollution abatement policy as well then efficiency in environmental resource use should be done then uh, environmental governance enhancement of resources of environmental conservation that should be our priority so what were the principles principles of national environment policy after discussing national environment policies objectives we will discuss what are the principles so there were three main principles that all human beings are the center of sustainable development concerns so if we think that this sdg goal is something which is just theoretical and which is just defined to uh, to uh, reflect that international bodies are taking care of environment no that is not the case so if we if you have uh, listened to the last lecture where we have studied about the international environment governance in that also a first sustainable development goal was that human beings are at the center okay so our national environment policy again reflected the international principles of environmental governance so in that case all human beings should be treated equally and we should be and we should ensure that we are at the center of concern for sustainable development and we should be able to uh, play our pivotal role in in pro pro providing healthy and productive life to everyone uh, in, uh, including the natural resources including our environment including our flora and fauna okay again we have a right to development we definitely need development we cannot stop development so we need, require to meet uh, equi uh, developmental and environmental needs for present and future generations okay because future generation also have this right to development not just the present and the generation has this right to development everyone ha should have the right to development and then environment protection should be part of any kind of developmental activity so any kind of new project that comes in picture in present times it has to take care of environment protection it has to get environment clearance if its area is of certain extent if it is uh, requiring send, uh, uh, consent for uh, establishment consent for operation if it is utilizing water resources it has to take consent under water act otherwise under air act if it is generating hazardous waste it has, it has to get uh, authorized under hazardous waste acts and rules so that has to be a part of development process that's why have those kinds of requirements are there for any kind of development activity in our country so these were the principles and uh, there are uh, around uh, uh, 11 principles okay so if you see uh, from regulatory reforms precautionary approach equity public trust doctrine legal liability economic efficiency so if you have been attending my past two three lectures you might must have understood the concept of every uh, term which which is written on this slide right from the regulatory reforms the precautionary approach the equity the public trust doctrine because all the international environment governance related uh guidelines and uh, aims and objectives they were also framed around these principles so accordingly in our national environment policy is also framed around each of these principles but we'll still discuss each of them so uh, starting with precautionary approach precautionary approach basically advocates that there are some credible threats and of serious and irreversible damage damage which cannot be reversed back damage which once caused will stay there forever so that kind of damage if it's there we have to take precautionary approach because before causing that kind of damage okay before uh, dis disposing of any nuclear waste before disposing of any chemical uh, spill before disposing of any effluent which is high in its uh, recalcitrant compound concentration which is high in heavy metals into underground water into soil dumps so that kind of irreversible damage should always be avoided and there should be precautionary approach then lack of full scientific certainty on until and unless you are well aware what kind of 
impact it will cause to the environment you should not do that kind of activity if you are lagging any kind of scientific data or information about an activity which you are going to implement you should always use a reason for postponing the cost okay so uh, the cost of tackling that environmental burden okay so you have to have proper scientific knowledge you have to have proper scientific guidance before implementing any such activity which can cause irreversible damage and then you have to have proper measures to prevent that environment degradation second principle economic efficiency economic efficiency as you as the name suggests you have to utilize minimum of resources to get maximum of benefits efficiency is when you are utilizing whatever you your system is designed for to its maximum extent okay so that is your efficiency so again if the principle requires that the services of environmental resources be given economic value because most of the times our environmental resources are sub, are observed to be available free of cost okay we all have this idea that we do not have to pay for the air quality but when we go to a doctor we pay for our medical bills we do get the value of air, air quality when we buy an uh, inhaler when we buy an in a nebulizer when we buy an air filter or uh, air cleaner uh, in our houses nowadays earlier we used to uh, hear the name of air conditioner only okay but now there is a Uh, an air cleaning equipment also that is available in the market so when we go to buy that equipment we understand if we if we would have been given a good air quality we should not have been investing in this kind of equipment so unless there is a uh, value attached to any environmental resource we cannot uh, advocate protection of that environmental resource so we have to have polluter pays concept we have we need to ensure efficiency of resource use and the principle of efficiency should be streamlined in all our processes and procedures so that we can minimize the cost and delays okay so again uh, what are the entities with incomparable values so some there are some values there are some entities which have a uh, value which cannot be calculated okay for example your well being the impact of uh, good having good aesthetic uh, scenery impact of having good uh, aesthetic natural environment that is incomparable okay so if you say that okay uh, we are having few beautiful tourism sites we have eco tourism sites land sites you calculate value of those resources though monetarily i'll be able to calculate the value but otherwise if you consider their uh, total value in their total lifetime their value is incomparable okay so you should not accept any kind of risk for compensation in money or conventional goods and services to uh, risk those kind of resources which has which have incomparable values and then we have to have a conventional economic cost benefit calculation before we have priority in, in allocation of societal resources okay again equity equity we have been uh, studying again and again intra generational equity intergenerational equity equity is basically equal distribution of resources okay so again this equity uh, plays a very special role in given giving entitlements to participation in giving and uh, uh, right to participate in the process of decision making for example in all kind of projects which we are implementing today through international funding there is a process of consultation public consultation even in eia process apart from construction projects in every project there is a provision of public consultation okay public hearing so in those processes we are we are giving we are being given power to participate in the decision making process but most of the times we don't even care to look at the notice which comes in a newspaper for any public hearing and many of you might not be even aware that such kind of notice comes in newspapers in uh, our reputed dailies so that people are made aware about any new project activity which is coming in their vicinity 
okay so if we are aware that such decision making processes are existing and we can be a party to that we can play a role in uh, those uh, decision making processes then definitely we'll do that but if you are lacking awareness and if you are thinking that equity means just distribution of resources in equal quantity no that is not the case it is again a right to take part in every kind of project activity then legal liability so every uh, polluter should have a legal liability so that there is no other episode like bhopal gas tragedy okay or there is no fire breaking out in any uh, cinema hall like that happened in delhi years back so all those uh, issue, chemical leakages or chemical spills from industry even spills in mari uh, oceans uh, due to ships and uh, due to uh, 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 like spillages from the tankers oil transporting tam tankers in um, oceans so all those episodes can be avoided if everybody knows that okay i am going to pay for this pollution if if it is caused by me and that paying for pollution uh, will be much higher cost rather than going for a uh, process which gives me minimum risk which involves minimum risk and minimum damage to the environment so unless and until we pl uh, place a legal liability on any or on every polluter we'll, we cannot have this control of environment pollution okay so there has to be a strict liability that is imposed on obligation to compensate the victim so if in present scenario if a, even if a, an education institute does not takes environmental clearance its uh, its vc can be directly taken to court or it can be directly imprisoned okay he or she can be di directly imprisoned in any other uh, case of uh, 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 any kind of legal laxity they, there is no such provision so in environmental guide rules and regulation there is provision of strict action okay so again public trust doctrine uh, it advocates that state should be an absolute owner but all the uh, but a trustee of all natural resources it is an owner to take care of the natural resources which are meant to be used by public and it is meant for enjoyment of the masses okay so we have an a legitimate interest in a large number of people protection okay as a matter of national strategic national interest again decentralization is also a principle because we want to have power at local level as well okay not just at the central level or at the state level even the local public authorities they should have a uh, power to get themselves involved in protection of environment to address their local issues okay because at local level governance they are better equipped and they are better uh, uh, understanding they have a better idea and data related with the problems environmental challenges that are uh, occurring in their area so that's why decentralization also plays a big role and in covid 19 uh, phase also you must have observed that first uh, ban and first uh, lockdown was introduced at central level but after that that central level uh, uh, like uh, idea or the central level governance was transferred to the state and local level so any local uh, body who found that okay my area is having more number of cases they can implicate a local level lockdown uh, or uh, a restriction on movement of people in that area rather than expecting central uh, central guidances or central lockdown okay so that was the idea which was also utilized during uh, decentralization uh, processes in covid-19 control again in, in integration is again an inclusion of environmental considerations in sector level policy making so how social and natural sciences should be integrated together how society needs to understand more about natural resources and how that can be introduced in policy research so it did this involved integration at various levels now for example even department of science and technology tells every research body every institution who takes up funding for some kind of r and d activity to uh, uh, and integrate with them to uh, associate with them any 
a business organization or any uh, organization which is having advancement in development of prototypes okay so that after an r and d is being funded by dst and after it is being implemented by a research body by iit by iims that research just does not lies in their libraries that research is again utilized to develop some kind of prototypes it is used to develop some kind of employment it is used for development of enhancement of environment protection okay so that is the idea while we, when we go for linkages in various departments in various agencies and uh, we reflect those uh, strengthening of relevant li uh, linkages in our environmental policies then environment standard setting because if there is no standard okay this you can just uh, this is the highest level of pollution that you can create after this you have to be implicated under pollution pace principle unless such kind of standards are not set every uh, polluter will keep on polluting the environment because that is not set through any standard and again that is immeasurable okay so we have to have technologies we have uh, research uh, protocols we have sop standard operation protocols where we can uh, measure that pollution we can measure those standards we can measure particular parameters which have been identified by central pollution control board and ppcd so all those things we will we'll be discussing in the next lecture related with eia also so in this uh, we have to have environmental standards that cause risk to human health technical feasibility cost of compliance strategic considerations okay again next principle is preventive action where you have to prevent any kind of environmental damage to come up in first place itself okay then environmental offsetting offsetting means to protect threatened or endangered species that are of special uh, importance okay so if for example exceptional re uh, reasons of overriding public interest such protection cannot be provided in particular cases so cost effective offsetting measures should be taken up to restore that activity and the lost environmental services to the same public for example if some kind of uh, damage has happened which is not under control of any uh, activity or developmental project for example due to earthquake only for e e even if it is a natural disaster some kind of uh, damage has happened in some uh, protected biodiversity area so we should have uh, take a uh, approach to offset that environmental damage and to protect more uh, of the threatened and endangered species okay so we we can override public interest in those exceptional cases then actions and strategies were also planned for national environment policy we have uh, many action plans and strategies and if you search for specific sectoral action plans and strategies you will find that even for the panchayat and local urban bodies there has been specific uh, in which centers environment information centers are there there are state and local governments uh, are also introduced in these strategies and action plans so at every level there have been specific action plans and specific strategies so that no part of the community is left out while implementing these envi national environmental policies then regulatory reforms were introduced as we discussed in the last lecture where we have a uh, comprehensive discussion on air act water act uh, solid waste act hazardous waste act so all those acts and uh, amendments were discussed in our last lecture so they are they all form a part of regulatory reforms okay so from time to time reform means you have formed something and again you are uh, making some amendment that is reform okay so we have made made some regulatory provisions and from time to time we identify okay some kind of concern is there some kind of gap has been left out there is some cross sectoral policy that needs to be revised that we can we have some uh, new technology and strategy which can be introduced so all those measures can be introduced through new reforms and new amendments then uh, this latest regulatory reform came up in environmental impact assessment where we had 
defined a principal methodology how new projects are going to be appraised how they are going to be reviewed and we are going to discuss this in very detailed manner uh, in the next lecture how large scale diversion of prime agricultural land requires environment appraisal before going for that uh, diversion before taking up any change of land use clu which i was talking about then how cluster of industries related with some specific activities they can they should be clubbed together in industrial zone in special economic zones in it sector zone or for some uh, uh, like we established an a large area development project for cycle industry in uh, ludhiana so those kind of clustering of industries and related development activities helps you to tackle certain uh, wastewater uh, issues that is related with, to that industry through employing a central facility for pollution control for air pollution for hazardous waste because although industries are having same characteristics of their inputs and outputs and they will be generating same kind of wastewater same kind of air pollution related parameters so it is better to have industries clusters because we are we will be able to manage the issues the environmental problems which will be caused by those industries collectively and it will be beneficial for all the small scale and medium scale industry who do not have enough resources to have their independent uh, and affluent treatment plant or air pollution control devices so if they are connected together if their pollution streams can be connected together and treated together it will be beneficial to establish that, that kind of centralized development activity uh, area okay so again post project monitoring for example in mining uh, at present if you if you go for clearance in of mining projects you have to have a post uh, mining plan okay that is called reclamation plan so what kind of reclamation activities which, which uh, will be done after you leave that mining area because if you leave a mining area after uh, extraction of uh, minor or major minerals it is it looks like an abundant wasteland okay but if you have a reclamation plan you do uh, a forestation activity like in delhi also you must have seen earlier that open land hill side at the uh, delhi border was left as it is but when uh, ngt intervened it has been planted now it has been covered with different kind of plant species and it uh, looks like a green area and it is now being redeveloped okay if due to reclamation activities the kind of damage that was being caused uh, to that land as an open landfill site is now recovering okay so those post project monitoring activities and implementation of environment management plan was again monitored and again regularized through these regulatory reforms so what are what is the role of regulatory reforms through the examples which i have given to you you can understand that it helps you in if some kind of regulatory reform is there you you might not take any time okay what should be done if this problem has occurred because you will just go through that act okay that can be done it can be penalized this person who is cause pollution has to pay this much for this kind of pollution so it will help you in a faster decision making and a greater transparency so that rule will be again same for everyone no uh, one polluter may not pay more one polluter may not pay less if it is if it has caused a damage which has which can be measured through standard it can, which is there in the regulatory reforms you you ought to have a faster decision making then you have access to information you have use of information technology based tools you have capacity building you have all the data related with air quality is now available on central pollution control board sites okay your ground uh, ground water uh, monitoring plans and ground water level uh, plans they are also available on central ground water body websites so all those gis tools and all those even in google you have uh, tools wherein you can see how that land used to look 10 years back and what kind of devastation has been caused after an industry has been set up or even a project which is uh, implemented for the conservation of that area how that a project has changed the overall scenario overall spatial uh, view of that area it, even google earth can help you in uh, giving such kind of tools 
सो इट हेल्प्स यू इन ग्रेटर डिसेंट्रलाइजेशन इन ग्रेटर रेगुलेटरी मैकेनिज्म इट मेक्स यू इट गिव्स यू पावर टू फॉलो द प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफ गुड गवर्नेंस सो वॉट इज द स्कोप so these uh, regulatory reforms they vary from diversion of dense natural forest they, uh, to coastal regulation zone even for coastal regulation zone we will be studying uh, more in detail uh, along with eia uh, in the next lecture again living modified organisms which can be reviewed so that relevant scientific knowledge is taken into account and how national bio safety guidelines can be implemented so that no live uh, bio material is taken uh, away from our country or is taken outside our country okay then transboundary movement of uh, living modified organisms somebody can not just introduce a kind some virus or some uh, biologically damaging variety of some plant or animal or algae or fungi species in our water bodies so all those uh, regulations are there transboundary movement of living modified organisms gives you a multilateral uh, bio safety protocol okay then environmentally sensitive zones have been identified where which are having incomparable values where values are there they are having irreplaceable values which cannot be replaced by any kind of uh, costing or evaluation method so they have been given legal status of environmentally sensitive zones so that and uh, sensitive zones are again considered while going for any environment impact assessment notification related clearance so then we have regulatory reforms for capacity development initiatives and enhancing and conserving of environmental resources related with land degradation reclamation of wastelands forest and wildlife then forest and wildlife and there has to be a remedy uh, to uh, any in uh, serious historical injustice that is being caused uh, in conflict with forest departments and there has to be an innovative strategy to increase the forest and tree cover from the level which existed at two th in 2003 that was just 23.69% so in uh, it was a policy uh, ref reformulation which was introduced that we should go for at least 33% by 2012 okay so again uh, now we have to conserve that level uh if if we do if we cannot enhance that level we have to conserve that level then bamboo and similar other species were denotified under forest conservation act and we have to also expand the protected area network and site specific eco development programs were introduced for example wetland programs were introduced wasteland programs were introduced and specific programs for mangroves and other uh biosensitive zones were introduced then empowering building capacities and facilitating access to finance that for example local people and tribals they were not having enough capacities to have access to finance and then strengthening and their capacities and measures for captive breeding breeding okay and release into the wild of endangered species for example recently our prime minister modi has uh, released uh, tiger species in our country so uh, on on his birthday so those kind of uh, activities can be done only if we have national policy which goes in hand with those kind of action plans at ground okay so again explicit attention has to be given on potential impacts on development project for example whenever you are doing any kind of development activities you have to see within 500 meter radius which biodiversity hotspots are coming which green areas are coming if there is any protected zone which is coming if it is coming you have to go to the relevant department if it is a protected forest or reserve forest then you have to go to the forest department you have to take their permission you have to submit the drawings which shows the distance uh, in google image and then they will actually calculate how much distance is there and as per the notification of that reserve forest how much distance uh, is allowed for that construction activity to actually take place or not 
and if it is not allowed within the distance that has been given in the notification for that reserved forest it will not be allowed so we have uh, clients who which we regularly suggest okay now if there is a distance from this lake supna lake or this uh, protected forest then you have to go to this department submit these kind of document then you will take it will take around 15 to 20 days then only you will be given clearance you will be given actual distance which is uh, for with from the location of your project to the protected site and we, whether it is safe or unsafe so if it is written safe then only they can go for environment clearance okay so before environment clearance they have to get clearance from these biodiversity hotspots or reserved areas or uh, protected forests okay then this is again in line with our national policies and national principles under wildlife conservation and biodiversity okay then you have to enhance conservation of genetic resources you have to conserve genetic material of threatened species of flora and fauna in designated gene banks so those gene banks have already been identified they have already been established for different kind of species in different parts of our country then you have revision of patent act how these uh, disclosure of source and geographical origin of biological material can be controlled this is again laid down uh, in elaborately manner in uh, under wildlife conservation act so uh, when we see about the, how we can conserve environmental resources, there is a uh, very pertinent issue of climate change impact. So all our activities, they should be in congruence with uh, intellectual property rights also. Then we have to take care of the uh, Himalayan mountain range in terms of uh, the uh, uh, in terms of the threats which is which are there for through climatic change effects so according to the third assessment report of the ipcc intergovernmental panel on climate change almost 67 percent of the glaciers in the himalayan mountain range they have retreated in the past 10 years okay so uh, that past decade has shown actual data on how this uh, these glaciers have are been uh, are retreating themselves so for that purpose we have to ensure uh, the protection of these uh, areas and how we can uh, reduce the impact that is being caused due to climate change even if we cannot reduce how to mitigate those impacts so for example gangotri glacier is again retreating by 30 meters per year so we are uh, doing a lot of research activities a lot of uh, uh, R&D projects are going on to promote research in glaciology and to evaluate the impacts of climate change on glaciers and river flows so that we can in, uh, 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 we can evolve strategies and tools to control those impacts. Okay. So again, uh, in enhancing the con conservation of environmental resources, water resource is a prime resource. And we have many uh, integrated approaches for management of river basins, like wetland management is a part of river basin uh, uh, strategy. Then uh, we have uh, a multi-purpose river valley dams, power plants, industries, estuarine flora and fauna, watershed management projects, then installation of water saving closets and taps in houses. So in building bylaws also, if you see our national building uh, bylaws, Again, those bylaws have been revised and they have specific measures to control water at industry level, at local level, at household level, at agricultural level. So there are many strategies uh, to for efficient water use, for promoting efficient use of groundwater as well. For example, nowadays, if you want to take permission for groundwater extraction, you have to submit impact assessment report for groundwater exploitation. Okay, so earlier that kind of report was not submitted. So I have already uh, made 50 such reports, uh, maybe more than that. So uh, for in that report, you have to give the complete area of, around your project site. You have to identify what are the threats which can be there from to the groundwater levels. What are the different kind of industries which are existing around your project area? What can be the cumulative impact of water groundwater extraction in that area? 
then what are you what are uh, different strategies and industries using specifically in house for controlling of their uh, water extraction for uh, whether they have installed groundwater meters whether they are doing recycling of groundwater whether they, they are minimizing the use of groundwater then whether they are adopting rainwater harvesting techniques whether they have adopted any ponds and if they are utilizing more groundwater then they can recharge or uh, uh, restore then they have to levy some taxes they have to pay some cess for groundwater as well okay again the, we are, they are promoting efficient water use techniques like drip irrigation among farmers and they are remunerative alternative crops which are being introduced in himachal also uh, japan international cooperation agency they have introduced a project for uh, alternative crops for giving uh, knowledge up to the local masses and communities who are involved in agricultural uh, business and who are doing agriculture from uh, ages uh, through cash cropping okay so they have been uh, they have been introduced to other uh, uh, crops like alternative crops which are utilizing less of water and giving more uh, nutrition and giving more economic benefit to them okay so many uh, ex exotic vegetables like capsicum and broccoli and mushrooms which were unknown to uh, himalayan regions and to people in uh, himachal pradesh so th those kind of trainings are being given to these people and how they can reduce water consumption in their agricultural fields and farms and then dissemination of groundwater potential maps like i have already discussed there is a specific website on central groundwater board uh, main portal and through that uh, site you can identify what kind of areas uh, a new project is coming up for whether it is under exploited zone or a safe zone whether it can be given clearance for groundwater what are the potential maps ground for groundwater what are the different kind of pollutants that are there if there is any threat of cadmium introduction in groundwater if there is any specific heavy metal high level in that area then improving productivity per unit of water which we have again discussed before about the specific consumption of resources so for per unit of water what is your productivity what is your level of per unit production okay so what those kind of assessments are now required through water audits i have already done water audits for uh, an housing complex for a mall okay for an institution and those kind of water orders are being man are mandatory if some industry is utilizing excessive use of water is doing excessive use of water then uh, central pollution control board or state pollution control board can demand that industry to make their water audit report so that they can assess what kind of uh, leakages and what kind of issues are there which is causing wastages in that industry then uh, what for groundwater management also you have to have specific water quality parameters to be monitored you have to have piezometers so basically piezometers are introduced along with uh, in a similar mechanism like we introduce your two well pumping machines so in that piezometer you can get, uh, uh, take water sample there is a provision of taking water sample from groundwater through those piezometers and monitor the level of groundwater in those areas so that whenever there is an issue that when whenever the groundwater level is going down too much what kind of recharging activities should be introduced can be identified and if the uh, the uh, industry has to pay for the damage caused then also it can be identified so the latest uh, common uh, total solid facility sites or com common hazardous waste facility sites they all are having these piezometers so that they can monitor whether any kind of leachate is polluting the groundwater or not okay then wetland conservation is very important because these are some of the important freshwater resources and the the explicit account of impacts on wetlands under major development project has happened okay so to, to ensure that these wetlands are conserved we have very strict guidelines nowadays uh, so especially in punjab where there are more than 5 uh, wetland areas 
who are of very national and international significance then in mountain ecosystems also we have uh, specific guidelines and reforms that have been introduced related with sustainable tourism eco tourism and what are the best practices where tourism can take place accord in line with protection of ecosystems of environment so there have been specific guidelines for tourists who are going to mountain areas who are very virgin mountain areas to ensure that they do not cause any kind of solid waste uh, issue any kind of plastic waste cannot be just littered anywhere in those areas then for pollution abatement also there are specific policies related with clean energy sources like biofuels so relate, uh, recently we have also implemented a project with iit mandi where uh, they they were given funding for a project where sewage treatment uh, plant was used to uh, identify a biofuel okay so how a biofuel can be uh, created from sewage that was their conceptual plan and r and d idea so those kind of uh, uh, technologies those kind of advancement and researches are being uh, supported through our environment policies so for controlling water and whatever examples i am giving you are just one or two examples and many other uh, projects and many other studies are also going on innumerable uh, number of studies are going on so i am just giving you an example to give you an idea whether such uh, philosophies whether such principles which we are studying they have um, any meaning in ground so they do have a meaning they do are being implement, implemented practically on ground and i have myself uh, been in involved in such kind of projects so again soil pollution control strategies emphasize capacity development for proper solid waste management practices that's why so to control soil pollution nowadays we have to take environment clearance even for a solid waste management plan or for a common to total solid disposal feasible facility or even for a scientific uh, scientifically designed landfill also you have to take environment clearance so that you do not cause any soil pollution ground water pollution air pollution or noise pollution and again for conservation of heritage sites for example if if i am going to develop any kind of heritage site and uh, convert it into a museum or convert it into any hotel i have to conserve the original uh, construction activities or i have to con conserve the original construction materials which were utilized like uh, in punjab there is an extensive use of shahi bricks these are thin uh, sized small bricks and these bricks are made from clay material through uh, indigenous techniques of mortar and through indigenous techniques of like uh, we have a smaller version of those techniques like we ground uh, wheat into flour through chakkis so those kind of big chakkis were used for uh, developing construction material in those uh, days in uh, for for our heritage sites so nowadays if you are uh, doing conservation activities in these heritage sites you have to conserve the original construction material you have to again conserve those uh, shahi bricks and utilize them again to refurbish or re uh, uh, for uh, re reconstruction of those kind of heritage sites again uh, for certifications indicators we have environmental standards which refer to both acceptable levels of specified environmental quality parameters and which also specify permissible levels of discharges okay so these environmental standards are being implemented through the acts and guidelines which we have already gone through in the last lecture and iso certification again we'll be discussing uh, in too much detail in a, uh, in the next unit so uh, if you see uh, for proper mitigation and proper uh, information of these policies we have to have environment awareness education and information so that is the idea why every school is now having basic uh, environment uh, related uh, curriculum in their uh, uh, system so that all the school children they are having important uh, information about environmental protection about the requirements why there are so much environment related problems about climate change 
and there is a real time online information system all the stps sewage treatment plants effluent treatment, treatment plants they are connected with the continuous environment monitoring system cems so these are also again in central pollution control board's guidelines and all those parameters which are being monitored in those uh, centralized environment monitoring systems they are being transferred to their local pollution control boards uh, through online access okay so there is a continuous transfer of data from industries which are uh, uh, having higher risk of causing pollution directly to the pollution control board so that there is any ambiguity or there is any uh, 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 like any permissible level is crossed and any liability is to be there on the side of uh, industry that should be uh, uh identified immediately and they, they should be informed immediately to correct that uh, measure so at least two or three times they are told okay this level is going uh, up, over and above their permissible level and after that proper measure is taken to uh, ensure that they have uh, they are legally penalized and they have to in, uh, incorporate any environment uh, control or mitigation uh, technology or tool in their industry so all those measures are also there and then you have partnership and stakeholder involvement with communities with ngos with international bodies so there are so many partnership and stakeholder involvements allowed these days by even local governments as so that they can promote more of environment conservation at local level and then for capacity building also you must be observing uh, even uh, during covid period there were so many online training programs and capacity building programs and after that it has multiplied so many times that every day you will be learning more about environmental issues one or the other lecture is going on at, even at the ministry of environment and forest site also you will find a capacity building program and there are so many online uh, training programs that are going on to build capacity towards uh, uh, environmental protection for all the stakeholders okay then research and development is also there and uh, people are given specific funding opportunities by the government in key areas of research and new technologies are being evolved uh, through CII also, through DST also, through MOEF also, and through other many international funding agencies, they are also coming up with uh, new ideas for uh, uh, key areas of research. Again, international cooperation, I'm talking again and again because uh, I have worked with few of these funding agencies. So they have larger commitment to multilateral instruments and they are providing assistance specific specifically to developing countries like us. So a uh, review of the policy is being again done continuously to redefine the objectives and principle to introduce any kind of new technology or any kind of new guideline or fiscal or economic perspective that needs to be taken up. So thank you so much. Now uh, I would like to take up any questions. Recording ban kar dena. Rita, recording one. Ah, uh, one minute, I'll tell you. 